Hey, everybody, and welcome back to the Ruby Rogues podcast. Uh, we have a few panelists that couldn't make it today, uh, either to, due to car trouble or uh, travel and work. Um, David Brady is going to try and join us here momentarily. But in the meantime, we have uh, Gregory Brown from Ruby Mendicant University. Um, he's the developer of the Prawn Library and several others. He's the author of uh, Ruby Best Practices, and uh, he blogs at MajesticSeaCreature.com. Welcome, Greg. And then we have um, James Edward Gray from Gray Productions. He wrote the TextMate book and uh, has built some awesome stuff, including the Faster CSV Library. And uh, we're always happy to have James on the podcast. And I would never let car trouble keep me away. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm Charles Max Wood from TeachMeToCode.com. And uh, we're going to be talking today about the Ruby Gems discussion that's going on. Um, we're going to be talking about more than just the opinions involved. Um, we're going to be talking about some of the, the concepts that surround uh, some of the things that people are discussing and, you know, kind of share what what our thoughts are on some of these things. So uh, uh, I just want to welcome our panel one more time and we'll go ahead and get started. Great, Greg. Yeah, you probably know more than anybody what all has been going on with Ruby Gems. Can you give us the dying tour of the recent kerfuffle? Yeah, I mean, I guess I'm I'm gradually learning about it, but like two weeks ago, I knew absolutely nothing about it, which I thought that would make me a, a good person to sort of mediate the uh, situation, get some of these tensions to go down a little bit. It turns out that I wasn't necessarily right about that, but uh, <laughs> um, basically, there were a number of different things that have been going on. One is that Ruby Gems has been sort of rapidly changing since version 1.4, um, but without a well-established release policy. Um, so the communications with the community weren't that great, and things broke as a result of it. And some of this stuff was things that broke because of patches in other libraries. Some things were things that happened in Ruby Gems, but whatever it was, you know, the communication wasn't good and things were breaking, affecting end users in a pretty serious way. Um, and then to sort of throw gas on the fire, the Ruby Gems 1.8 uh, release um, had a tremendous amount of warnings, uh, deprecation warnings, because they're trying to get rid of um, some of the old cruft, um, but it turns out that a lot of that cruft is still used by a lot of things. Um, with a little bit of prodding and pushing, they actually removed uh, two of the warnings that were causing almost all of the um, problems for people uh, in Ruby Gems 184 and 185. But before they did that, people were going crazy because they would run, like they'd open IRB or they would run um, just a Ruby script and it would just help print pages of warnings that didn't respect verbose, so they basically would just make it very hard to see the output of things. Um, that's pretty much been solved. Um, people are still sort of stressed out about the release policies. I made some progress with those guys on that stuff. But in the process, uh, it, this is sort of too little too late because um, Ruby Gems has been officially forked um, as of yesterday by Slim Gems, which is uh, Lauren Siegel's. Um, and Whatever progress that I've made in the last week or so has made some improvements, but it's also this has sort of refanned the flames, and now we're just in a big mess again. All so right. that's pretty much the executive summary, even though it's not that short. Right. Well, that that kind of gives us an idea, and I also want to wait, welcome uh, David Brady to the call. He just uh, jumped in. Howdy. And talk about commitment. He came directly from the hospital for this. Well, so it's 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 like. I don't know if this is more commitment or less. I'm actually fine. Um, my wife had surgery this morning on her eye, and I am the caretaker and babysitter. And I was making sure she had enough uh, drugs and uh, enough Netflix uh, easily within reach of her uh, uh, location where she's convalescing. And he means totally legal drugs and yes. totally legal Netflix movies. Absolutely. <laughs> Actually, I do on both counts. We've got a prescription and a subscription, as the case may be. Oh, man. I thought so. I knew you better than that, David. Yeah, well, you know, so I, I lie about a lot of things just to keep my street cred up. Oh, man. All right, so redirecting. Greg was just giving us the dime tour of 
uh, what went wrong in Ruby Gems. So in Ruby Greg, Gems, I I came in kind of on the on the end of that, and uh, I, I think I heard enough of it to add my own two cents to this, which was, uh, I love you, Greg. I really, really respect what you're doing, and I kind of predicted that this would happen because in a in a very angry society, as soon as there is the, the big revolution comes after the first concession. And you kind of represented the peace offering in that first concession, and that's when the the revolutionaries realize, oh, we've got momentum, let's run with it. But you know, the funny thing is that honestly, and um, I know now that I'm saying this, it's just making things worse. I don't think that it's that big of a revolution. I mean, mm -hmm. the things that I was talking about about getting the problems fixed, those would stay on top of Hacker News for like two days at a time, and the the. Slim Gem stuff basically on Reddit just went up there and then disappeared pretty quickly. And yeah. on Hacker News was up there for half a day, got a lot of commentary, and is now gone as well as well off the front page. Yeah. Um, there are there are, and I don't want to say that it's like a small amount of people because that would be unfair, but it is a minority of people who are being really loud about this stuff. Um, yeah. And um. I just think right now that Slim Gems is uh, causing more confusion than it's helping with anything. Um, and I don't know that it's a revolution. I, I just, yeah. from all the people I've talked to, I just haven't seen yeah. that many people seriously in favor of it. Yeah, I, I, th I think you're right. I think revolution is kind of the wrong, I, I didn't mean to put that word on it. I just meant that pattern uh, seems to be playing out. There's a, there's, there's a quote that says that the, the, the best way to disenfranchise a man of the political system is to have his candidate get elected. And <laughs> uh, for all the people that are very, very angry about Ruby Gems, um, maybe, I, I don't know, but it's a subset who will then agree or believe that Slim Gems is the right answer. And so, you know, it's a subset of a subset of a subset. Right. Yeah. I mean, part of it also is that, like, I've been working with Lauren. I mean, I, when this mm -hmm. first, when I first got involved in this, the first thing that I did was I spent an hour on a private Skype call with him and uh, Nick Coranto to talk through some of these issues. And that's actually what I've, I focused on that because, I mean, there's two things going on here. There's the things that everybody cares about, like those deprecation warnings or things just breaking. Yeah. And then there's like the philosophical issue of the API backwards compatibility and release standards and all that stuff. And those things are very important, but they weren't urgent at that moment. But still, right. at the same time, like it was really important for me to engage with Lauren and I've been doing that more or less. And I'm yeah. having... I've, I've, I, before I got on this call, we were talking to him about where Evan had the idea, Evan Phoenix had the idea of introducing a compatibility layer as a gem that would basically guarantee uh, backwards compatibility across all Ruby Gems versions from 137 on up. Wow. Um, like, it, people think, like someone tweeted to me uh, yesterday, oh, you're not on speaking terms with Lauren. The funny thing is that I am, and I've been working with him throughout this. And well, Lauren's a really nice guy. I mean, I, yeah, I can see him being really, really angry and really, really wound up. But yeah, he's he's a reasonable person. He's a nice guy. Well, I mean, reasonable or not, the point I guess the point that I'm trying to make is that everybody who's calling for blood uh, when it comes to Ruby Gems is not actually – actively working on the problem as far as they're not can. yeah they're not helping they're not no, helping. One, no one who is actively working on the problem has closed down communications or anything like that so that's yeah. why it's sort of surprising to me that you get this fork out there and people are so excited because they think that they're being released from some sort of tyranny and then if you go and just sit on the ruby gems irc channel or pretty much anywhere else where this is being seriously discussed you can see that people are still trying to work this out um, yeah it, 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 so I just find it to be more of a distraction than anything at this point in sure. time. I don't think that it's been I, – I think the main problem right now is that there is not enough reasonable information for someone who doesn't want to dedicate a week of their time to this or more mm -hmm. to make an informed decision. I don't know that there's enough that I can make an informed decision. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I kind of agree with that. So when I saw all of the Ruby Gem stuff going down this week, I, I basically just started reading – uh, to see what was going on, and I, I went back and read Ryan's blog post that was the original kickoff to Ruby Gems 18x, and and uh, went through that, and then I went and read several of Greg's blog, or, uh, blog posts, and then uh, after that, I read the current 
Ruby Gem source just to get a kind of a feel of the uh, state of everything. And, and, you know, I'm like, oh, I'll just spend a little time seeing what I can learn here. And, and then like, you know, a day later, I'm like, oh, wow, I kind of blew a day just trying to figure out what all this is about, you know? So, yeah. and, and I definitely don't understand all of it because I haven't read, you know, like the old releases of Ruby versions, which is, or Ruby Gems, which is one of the arguing points. But kind of getting back to it, I mean, we've definitely talked about the conflicts and stuff, which are interesting, but I think there are some actually kind of really uh, interesting technical problems in here that I'd kind of like to discuss. So Greg mentioned that there's uh, what, what basically drew this attention. Ruby Gems has been going through a very rapid growth period. Um, so he's been uh, he's been making a bunch of releases about like every month or so, maybe since January. Monthly. Yeah. yeah. So they've been they've been going through this really big growth period, and I think for the most part, people didn't really notice. And then uh, what brought the attention was in Ruby Gems one a they deprecated a lot of stuff, and so mm -hmm. it it started printing a massive amount of warnings, and that's what got everybody's attention. Well, this is kind of interesting because um, I was thinking about this and I was like, well, you know, I've definitely seen that kind of behavior in like, say, Perl before when you, when you would call deprecated stuff and, and people don't seem to mind it that much there. And I got to thinking about it, but, you know, Rubyists are so, um, Rubyists are so used to using IRB. And when you fire up that IRB and it just scrolls, pages and pages of crap and you can't you know oh i, I think the call dropped so uh, i think that makes it a bunch more obvious okay hang on there there was a little glitch there so uh we, yeah, we I, I lost james's audio there for a sec Oops. yeah it's like if you repeat your last sentence james that would probably yeah okay so what i was saying sorry about the uh break there but what i was saying was um that it, we're so used to working with code interactively and IRB that the deprecations, I think they, they hurt us more than they hurt uh, people who develop in different ways because, you know, you fire up IRB and then it scrolls five pages of, of crap while you're trying to get to a prompt just so you can, you know, play with some code. I think maybe that means that we have to think through our deprecations a little bit differently in the Ruby community. I, yeah. I, I also want to jump in here and just kind of wonder aloud, I guess, at what point this is, you know, the deprecations are really a problem because I've seen deprecation warnings in Rails and some of these other libraries when I run my server and things, and it, it doesn't seem to be as big a deal. And, you know, ultimately what it means <laughs> is upgrade your library, idiot. You know, and so in this case, it was a little bit different, I think, because the use in Ruby Gems is different. And I, I'm really curious as to, you know, I think James highlighted one of the differences, and that is that, you know, people are waiting interactively in the same place that they're getting these deprecation warnings, where in my case, on, when I'm running a web server, you know, it just kind of scrolls up with the rest of the logging. And, and so I'm curious, though, if there are any other things about Ruby Gems that make it different in this way, such that the deprecation warnings are more of a problem than they would be in some other library that you're just including in your code. They are. I mean, it is very much different because, for one, the, it, the warnings that you're seeing in Ruby Gems, there's not a whole lot that you can do about it. If you run... Um, gem pristine it'll try to clean up and rebuild your gems um, but that doesn't work safely with extensions unless you know that those extensions don't have any extra build flags they what is, what flags is gem pristine one -on -one. it basically what it does is it'll rebuild the gems based on the new specifications so I actually I don't know the details of it except for that that was the recommended solution for getting rid of these warnings because what it would do is it would remove the deprecated stuff from the gem specs um, that were being built, and then it would leave you alone after that. Um, hmm. But the thing is that these warnings, so they deprecated a whole bunch of stuff, a ton of stuff, but the two warnings, the default executable and has RDoc, were responsible for almost 100% of usual use of Ruby gems. So 
when they remove those two warnings, at this point, like I've been begging people to tell me if it's not silent for them anymore. And a lot of people are telling me that it is silent. So I don't think that we have that problem anymore. It was just those two, um, those two warnings were really, really noisy because it affected every gem. Yeah. The reason for that is because um, things like uh, Jeweler and some other like gem building tools we're putting those into the gem specs by default, um, which yeah. means that a whole lot of gems who aren't necessarily even using that stuff were affected by it. That yeah. was the problem. well, and that's that's really just a mainstream amplification of the real problem, which is that as a developer, I've got this third-party library that was built with this deprecated stuff, and I've upgraded Ruby gems, and now I'm getting this warning, and I don't actually have control over either piece of code, and so I've got a warning that I can't make go away. Right? Does that, does that make sense? Right. Yeah, and the problem is you are passing it to users, and the expectation was that there are plenty of gems out there that are not actively maintained. That right. Just, so if you just put the warnings on the build side, if they don't build a new gem, then they would never know about it. Um, right. So, right. So I think, I, I think Greg hit on one of the key problems there. Um, Ruby Gems experiences quite a bit of pain due to their technical debt. And that makes total sense when you remember that Ruby Gems was developed at, at a Ruby conference as like a hack fest project <laughs> originally, and it has grown from there and changed hands many, many times, including gaining its most recent maintainer like in January of this year. So it's it, it's definitely passed through many hands, and yeah. and they have a lot of technical debt from where it came from. So it's totally understandable how how it got crufty in places. Yep. And there's and there, go ahead. I, I just I also want to give uh, kudos to the the guys that are that have developed it all along, and the guys that are maintaining it now, because rather than look at what we've got and say, oh my gosh, what a huge lack of foresight, I just want to go all the way back to that first conference and say, what a triumph of Yagni. The, right. You know, that we, we were able to, the, the Ruby Gems has become what it is because it solves such a huge pain point. Okay, yeah, we did it very, very agile um, and very, you know, very ball of mud. And okay, it's coming back to bite us and we need to, we need to figure that out. So, right, yeah, at this point, it really, I mean, it, it, it is a tremendous amount of technical debt. It's, yeah. There's no way that you could possibly overestimate what sort of debt we're, we're going to need to pay down to get this to be right. Right. Mm -hmm. I, I have two questions about this, and one is, is did they actually remove the deprecation or just the warning? As of right now, the deprecations have gone away, so that means that like Hazard Doc and Default Executable are going to just basically stick around as no ops for another year or two. Okay. Mm -hmm. And then my other question is, so if if we have all this technical debt, I mean, don't we need to be deprecating some of these things or, or removing them? You know, getting rid of the cruft. I mean, even if even if it does change the API, and I guess this is another core issue. You know, in this. Uh, discussion is you know uh, wh where's the balance between maintaining the uh, the same API that people are used to versus you know being able to move ahead and move forward and and turn this into what we actually really need now so I think that's like a, an excellent point Chuck like I don't know about you guys but I have that instant reaction that whenever I look at any piece of code I didn't write the very first thing out of my mouth is oh that's crap you know, and I, I just, it's my lack of understanding of it. And the great irony of that is I always tell myself, oh, I could rewrite that in like 10 lines. And then I sit down and try to do it, rewrite it in 10 lines. And, you know, once I'm 400 lines in, I realize mm -hmm. why it handles all these edge cases that I didn't think of. You right. know, yeah. you miss uh, some of the subtleties there. Right. Yeah. And I, I think to some extent, there is that reaction. And, and this is definitely a point that's been uh, debated heavily in the, in the whole Ruby Gem Slim Jim 4, where, you know, is it possible that we can maintain the old APIs, fix the under the hood stuff, and, but still support the old interfaces? You know, e even if we have to do it in a less optimal way, I think it's totally acceptable to document a method to say something like, you know, uh, calling this method is extremely slow due to blah blah blah. Please switch mm -hmm. to you know these better solutions. Uh, mm -hmm. you know, 
So, James, I think the problem is a lot deeper than that because it's not just the surface level API that they're concerned about. It's you know all of the layers of Ruby gems, and the idea of using Ruby gems as a developer API is something that's relatively new, but it too was developed organically and not actually designed. So what that means is that there's a lot of libraries that are either monkey patching or trying to use the developer API, even though like a public API was never officially laid down for Ruby gems. So mm. when we say the old API, we're sort of looking at like, I don't know, a few years of gradually organically changing code without any, you know, mm. it, without any explicit intent of saying this is the API that you should be using. Right. The so tomatoes have been growing with no trellis. So basically what you're saying is in this case because there's no explicit public API, the entire library is the API. That's exactly right. Pe or at least say that people have been treating it that way, right? So like Bundler and things like that have done, you know, heavy monkey patching and it remains to be seen how much of that was total necessity and how much of that they could have really done with the with the APIs had they known better you know how to get in there and get the data they were after but the, I, I think it does point to the cost of that you know if you rip open ruby gems and and replace some pieces you know then then you may very well break with every single release you know and that we've definitely seen that with bundler um, you know and, and I think there's other other libraries that use it similarly actually uh, I think it was Lauren made an argument that you'd be surprised the number of libraries out there that do use the gems API and stuff so yeah. I have a, I have a potentially very stupid question, and if and if Greg, if you already answered this in the first little bit of the phone call, feel free to just tell me to shut up. But um, I'm gonna I'm gonna play idiot for just a minute because uh, it comes naturally to me. Um, can you give an example of some of these gems APIs, things that are not actually formal API? See, I I'm I'm just a client of gems. I all I know about Ruby gems is that there's some big ass repo hanging out there, disk space up in the cloud on the interwebs that I can get all these magical uh, binaries from that make my computer go. And I assume there's a setup method or a compile method because some of my gems do set up and some of them do compile. There's nothing else in the API as far as I'm concerned. So what are the what are the other API things that these people are using? What are they hacking on? What are the things that they're trying to expose through plugins right now? Can you can you can you illustrate that? Like, like uh, briefly? I can talk to you about the problems that I investigated, but I, I mean, I am very much just a consumer of Ruby Gems up until today, where I actually okay. started hacking on it. But I can okay. give I can give a very concrete example. Okay. Um, so, for example, uh, when you ask when you just do a require after Ruby Gems has been loaded, then it, it goes through its process and activates the gem that that best fits your require. In most cases, currently, that's going to activate the most recent copy of that gem uh, for for your needs, right? Mm -hmm. So right. Bundler, for example, when it's activating things, it has a much more complicated problem to solve because it's trying to activate everything as a set, and it's trying to make sure that if this library requires gem between you know version one and three, and this other library requires that same gem at version two, if you go ahead and activate the most recent one, version three, then you wow. screw that other library out of its require, right? right? So Bundler solves that problem. It figures out, well, we'll be okay as long as we activate version two because that will meet both of the requirements. And Bundler's so, smart enough to do that. That's right. That's what Bundler. Yeah, that's so the that's point. what Bundler does. Okay, that kicks ass. Examples. I can give a couple more examples along those lines because, I mean, part of what I've been trying to do is figure out what the breakage was or what the problems were and then see, try and figure out whether it was like Ruby Gems not doing something right or if there's some changes that need to be made so that people can do things without monkey patching or whatever. But, um, I mean, the issue that I feel, at least in part, set Lauren off was um, that Yard was using HasRDoc as a sort of indicator of whether or not Yard should be used. Uh -huh. um, and he was basically like using that flag, which at this point in time is basically just a no-op. It's ignored. Um, and 
when he was using that, they were thinking of removing it, but then that would make it so that he wouldn't know whether or not it was okay to run yard against it. And he was talking about how they need, like, he was talking about one of three things. It's like they either need a system that allows you to push um, static documentation um, up, like, as its own gem, um, or they need some sort of, like, Exec- they need to be able to run an executable at, at post install to generate the documentation, and there was something else that I forgot. But these are the sort of things where um, they're making use of a certain developer API that was actually there for a different reason. I mean, HazardDoc was there to tell you uh, basically the option was you could set it to false so that you could say, "Oh, I'm lazy and I don't do documentation." Mm-hmm. But it's been repurposed for other things, um, uh-huh. and so the removal effect it has a real effect on things that people use, um, even though it was being used in a way that wasn't intended to be used. All right. And I, I would like to point out that a lot of these things are, are very complicated. I mean, like, for example, Greg right there said, you know, uh, maybe one option would be to run an executable post install. That's not a good idea. You know, there's right? security concerns with that and all of that stuff. And that's why these things, like, it, something that sounds like simple has so much that you need to consider. Mm-hmm. Right. So I, I want to jump in here and I'm going to kind of hijack Greg's example for a second because um, I, I don't know that there's a clear cut answer to this. And, and I want to kind of get some opinions here. But it with that has our doc flag or setting, is that then Yard's problem or Ruby Gems problem? And, and I know that there's not a clear answer to that, but I, I kind of want to see what you guys think. That's a good question. I mean, um Hazardoc is a feature that Gems did support at one time, so it doesn't seem unrealistic that Lauren was using that for his purposes. I mean, it seems like a correct usage to me. Um, that said, you know, it, it, I don't think that Gems, I, I mean, I don't know. Some people used it well, some people didn't. And there is value to our docking even. Uh, even code that doesn't have documentation, right? Our doc at least runs through all the methods, uh, puts them up in a pretty web page, gives you a link to the source, blah, blah, blah. So there is value, I think, in our, our docking almost everything. You know, maybe there's some exceptions, but. Right, which uh, I, think that was the, I think that was the Ruby Gems party line, which is that they were just gonna enable it by default and then remove the option so that it, um, it, it does give you like those method listings, listings and things like that. But Lauren's counterpoint to that is that he wanted, like he said, some people really care about how their documentation looks and they don't want RDoc to run if it's formatted in Yard because it won't necessarily look good and all of that sort of stuff. Um, but and, or go ahead. Well, I, I was saying, I, I guess I can see that point, but those people definitely have the, op- the option to make documentation look the way they want somewhere else, you know, and, and link to it or whatever. I, I don't even know that Ruby Gems needs to be concerned with honoring contracts like that, you know. I don't, I don't know, James, because uh, to, to my mind, the, the underlying uh, difficulty here is that we're moving from the one model to the N model, which is the, the has our doc. What, the, what that really means is has doc, has any documentation, and our doc was the way to document. Well, now there's two ways to document. You can our doc or you can yard doc, and um, to, 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 to cavalierly say, yeah, you took all this time to document your stuff, but we're just going to fart out however we want to document your stuff, that doesn't seem right. That doesn't, uh, does that does that make sense? I, I'm not trying to, yeah, I guess, I'm not I trying guess to confirm but Especially because, like, there's actually some substantial differences between them. I sure. mean, there's Yard, and there's also, um, I just saw this at RailsConf, but there's also Rocco, which is based on Daco, and that's really, really cool. It's like a literate programming thing where it shows it shows the, um, the documentation, but then it also shows the code, like, side by side, so you can read the code while you're reading the documentation, like, in line, which is really freaking cool. But mm-hmm. you would use that sort of tool very differently than you would our doc. Right. But, I mean, the whole thing is, like, with this argument about that, I mean, that was actually very civil. Like, they just went back and forth about practical points, but it sort of ended in, oh, you should build a plug-in. And then Lauren said, okay, I will. And then he asked the question, I need to be able to have my plug-in disable other pre- or post-processors um, if they're present. Like, so he wanted to be able to have Yard look for our doc and disable it if it was enabled. And then that question never right, ended up being answered. But like, those are the sort of things where like, 
that conversation sort of fell apart at that point because it never got answered. And yeah. so people work around it. And so this is a this is a great point, I think. Um, the, I do think the Ruby Gems team has made some mistakes. Um, and, and one of them is that there has been a long-standing discussion about um, enhancements to Ruby Gems or even just like metadata in the gem spec, um, which is sort of kind of supported, but but not really. Um, and I think that would help solve a lot of these problems. I mean, if, if we had metadata in the gem spec, then at least to David Brady's point, you could throw in there and say, hey, this is documented and I used Yard to do it, you mm -hmm. know? And then Yard could look for that extra metadata and say, hey, these are my guys, I, I can handle them, you know? And, things like that. And, and the Ruby Gems team has been a little reluctant to like officially support things like that or support a, a healthy plugin API that does various things. And, and I'm not saying that, you know, being able to shut off other people's stuff is, is or is not a good idea. But, um, but maybe I think, you know, I think there is a lesson here that if you don't make a, you know, expandable API in the Ruby community, we do take it upon ourselves that, that we're free to monkey patch away, you know. So, yeah. Yeah. so not providing that API, you you can do so at your peril, right? In my but, talks with them, I really stress that point, and it's, they seem to come around on it because it's like they've had this plugin API, but it's not really something that's especially well advertised or especially well supported. Like you don't get the feeling of oh, this is designed for you to be able to extend Ruby gems. It's just sort of there. Like it almost feels like a way that they were just using it to extract things out of. Ruby gems instead of a sort of consumer API, and I suggested that they should change that, and they more or less agreed. But honestly, I think that that's something that's going to take time because yeah. I mean, I just think about systems that I've built, and like one of the reasons I'm getting involved in this is because I went through the whole PDF writer and then versus prawn sort of dealing with really complex systems that are just hard to get off the ground, and the internals themselves are hard enough to get right. That thinking about how to please users is really, really hard. And I mm -hmm. guess the point that I'm trying to make is that until RubyGems has solid internals or at least a direction for what those internals are going to look like, it's very hard to decide how you want to allow um, people to interact with the system uh, through a developer API. Right. So That's back assword and wrong. Like, what do you mean? That's inside-out development. That's solving the problem in in terms of what you already have to solve, right? What? So, sorry, this is the the most recent ADD cast that just went up on Tuesday. Pat and I talked about this for about an hour about how how you should start with what people want and then drive in. I realize it's Ruby Gems is really late in the game and it's also got a lot of technical debt, and so it's I'm being very cavalier saying that, oh, you should just do what the users want. Well, no, uh, very much so, because you're talking about seven years technical debt on a NP-complete problem. So you can't say that. if So, for example, I could not... I, w I was the maintainer of PDF Writer for a while, and it was a similar situation in which yeah. the project was unmaintained for a while, it was crappy, people wanted stuff out of it, but mm -hmm. I couldn't add a single feature or fix a single bug without investing 10 times the amount of time right. that I possibly want. So, I mean, right. the point is that if we were talking about a version 2.0 of RubyGems that was built ground up, then you would start with the problems that people have. Yeah, that's fair. That's fair. If you think about RubyGems more than two or three years ago, there was no notion whatsoever that it should be extensible. There was I, no concept of plugins or anything like that. My and very that first there, Ruby gem was I had to go to the website and sign up and ask them to let me please have a, have that gem. Do <laughs> you remember that when you had to go to the website and and like and ask Dave Thomas, "Can I please have this gem?" <laughs> right. So I guess the point I'm trying to make, just to draw an analogy, is go take a look at the source for PDF Writer and then ask yourself if you could or would want to build a plugin system on top of that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, I think yeah. that's a good point. But at the same time, I think David Brady does have a valid kind of angle on it in that the, I think one of the issues with current RubyGems development is very much that it's taken place in a bubble and and that it, it hasn't been concerned with what people need out of it and stuff like that. So to give an example, um, I think one of the problems that's come out of this is 
uh, RubyGems is not using a standard versioning scheme. Like uh, a lot of us now prefer semantic versioning and stuff like that. And there were requests made that, you know, could RubyGems please adopt a versioning scheme that we understand? And, you know, just even if it was published. And some people came back with, actually, they do publish one on their website. So then everybody went and read that one. And they're like, yeah, they do. And they're not following it. You know, which... <laughs> yeah, no, that, that, that's rational versioning or something. They totally don't follow that. Um, they follow Ruby's versioning, which basically means that they don't have a versioning policy. Not to be... <laughs> but um, that we... The release policy that I set up with them last week, and I'm trying to be realistic because we're talking about months or even years of opinions forming, and I'm trying to think, like, what can we do right now to make people happy, right? Mm -hmm. So what I ended up getting out of them is the idea that whatever ships with Ruby itself is the API that they need to stay compatible with until the next point release of Ruby came out. Right. So there is this concept of, like, if Ruby one uh, Ruby Gems one eight ships with one nine three, then you could use that API to guarantee you that everything up until when Ruby one nine four comes out um, will be compatible with Ruby Gems one eight. The problem so with is the numbering is all weird, right? Like because they're, they things might not be compatible with one another, and you're still looking back at one eight to figure out what the API is. But could you seriously think like that we would? call it Ruby Gems 2.0 right now because that's how you would start semantic versioning. Right. Right. I, I understand what you're saying there, but uh, more to the point. So one of the things Greg's talking about here, Ruby 192 ships with Ruby Gems and it ships with version 1.3.7, I believe. And the current version is 1.8.5 or 6, something like that. Um, yeah. So anyways, it's a, it's a massive stretch of versions, right, between the two now. And so, we, you know, the point is that, you know, like David Brady said, a lot of users just want gems to work and don't care about the other stuff and they just leave it there and that's fine. So, you know, all the people that do that from Ruby 1.9 up, they're using 1.3.7. So it's still a pretty relevant version, you know, as far as like it, it's seeing a lot of usage and stuff like that. And so when you introduce massive changes and, and things like that, but that kind of leads to, you know, uh, how do this is a good question? Ruby Gems is now bundled as a standard library, so for better or for worse, it is somewhat tied to Ruby's release schedule. I mean, we can't really say everybody's using Ruby Gems one eight until one eight is in Ruby and comes out with that release. You know, um, so how how do we handle that and develop libraries? Well, let me ask you this because you probably know this from um, emerging faster CSV. What is their versioning policy on standard libraries? Are standard libraries allowed to change APIs during like point releases? Um, I, you know, I don't, I don't think we're supposed to uh, change APIs during point releases. I, I think we're only supposed to do uh, bug fixes. Um, uh, you know, I, I don't know 100% that that's been followed. Uh, in but isn't that what their patch, I thought that that was what their patch level was for, bug fixes only. And I thought that like the deal now was actually doing something quite similar to what I described what RubyGems is doing now, which is that they, they put like the standard library in a, in a folder called like 191 to indicate that it's a 191 compatible where if one of the standard libraries changed, then it would have to be in a 193 folder or something like that, like like whatever the compatibility layer. It's, it's extremely confusing because of the arbitrary limitation that there won't be any Ruby 110. You are, you are basically right, um, and, and you're right, I didn't explain well. You're right that the patch release is the, is the bug fix only. But to your point on the Ruby 191, that's actually set at Ruby itself, and it's not something a library is in control of. So you can't say, you can't say, oh, my library is one nine three, and you right. So they start. would have to bump the entire, right. they would have to bump entire Ruby to one nine three compatibility if Ruby Gems one eight gets merged because it's not backwards compatible. Right, and I, I think I get that. Um, yeah, yeah, you're right. You're right about all those points. Yes. But the whole thing is that I'm sure that there's a fair bit of social pressure not to change the APIs, which is what's really, um, I'm concerned because I think that if RubyGems 1.8 doesn't make it into Ruby 1.9.3, then 
that we're going to have even further uh, complications and division and all of that stuff. Mm-hmm. But if it does, then it's going to force everybody to come to terms with the fact that things have changed. And it's going to force them to make the – like it, it reminds me of us holding really hard onto Ruby 186 as – Ruby 1.9 moved forward and 1.8.7 moved forward. And I just think that like on either side of the fence, whether you're pro a fork or not, that it's going to create much, much more issues with compatibility rather than fix it. I mean, so unless Slim Gems completely wins or you could convince the uh, Ruby Gems team to completely support 1.3.7 API forever, there's going to be a, it's going to be a problem, however you look at it. All right. Okay. Well, I I need to I need to wrap this up. We we need to get into our picks so that we can end this on time. Okay. So so I'm gonna end it right here. But uh, I, I do want to thank you all for for your opinion and for for sharing because I think I think we really kind of get to see not only uh, some of the issues that are surrounding Ruby Gems itself, but just maintaining a project and especially maintaining a project that's used the way that Ruby Gems is and by as many people as it is. And so uh, I want to thank you again for sharing and for helping us all understand this. Um, Let's go ahead and roll into the picks. Um, I'm going to explain them real quick because we have a new panelist uh, with Greg, and and then we'll jump in and and talk about what we have to pick. Uh, Before we we get to that, can I just say one more thing? Absolutely. Go ahead. Um, I really believe that the idea, not necessarily implementation, but the idea that just came up over the last couple of days that Evan Phoenix has of making a Ruby Gems future proof gem that builds stubs over the existing API so that the API can move forward, but the compatibility layer can be kept at first outside of Ruby Gems and then maybe pulled in if it shows to be promising. I think that's the way to go. That's the way that we can we can meet the needs of that fork without forking. Um, and I think that it's it's worth people taking a more serious look at. And I, I, that's all I would say. I, I want to append to that and, and, and second that based on the the notion that uh, stagnation the, – the, the complaint right now is that we've got this large body of stuff and the problem with it is that it's stagnant. And if you address that problem by not changing and not progressing and not evolving, the stagnation just gets worse. You just build more inertia. You just throw more crap on the old API and you have more problems. So yeah, if there's a way to to kind of future proof the API, if there's a way that you can you can be in, you know, Ruby Gems 195 and say, "Ah, oh, crap, I need the 137 API." If you can get that and use it, then down the road you go. Right. I, I do want to ask though real quick then, if you if you leave the old API in, then doesn't that leave you with old code you then still have to maintain? Or yeah, so they're not going to leave the old API in. Um, it's a, it's an independent project that um, right now we're trying to develop as a gem. Um, in like I said, this is just in the idea stage right now. But what it does is it looks at the gem versions and then on a need basis will load shims that basically have the API level of the old API, but use the new APIs under the hood to do the work. So you can get rid of all the code and just keep the API around. Okay, that makes sense. Yeah. And just to close this out, I just got to say that you know these are complex problems, and and people really are working uh, hard on solving them. And there's definitely been mistakes made on both sides, but uh, but they're doing some interesting development, and and people that are helping to do that are are definitely heroes of our community. Yeah, and and I really yes. I really really hope that people. Um, don't just look at kind of the, the drama or the, the arguments that are brewing, but really look at the issues, really see where they can jump in and contribute and, and really just make a difference because ultimately I don't know that this is something that we need to become divided over. I think this is something that we need to find a solution to. And so if we can come to understand the issues, I think it'll make better develop developers of all of us and it'll really help the community. So, yeah. Yeah, I agree. Okay, on to the picks. No more selling. We could talk about this for days. <laughs> yeah, we really could, and <laughs> that, that's part of the problem here. Anyway, um, so a pick. The picks are basically anything that you found that that make your life better. Um, they can be code related, but they don't have to be. So basically, I mean, we've had James pick Legos in the past, you know, and we've had other people pick. You know, he's also picked Tmux, which is a tool that you can use to. 
um, share a session or create a session on a remote server. So, I mean, there are a lot of different tools out there that, that people have su- suggested as well as toys and other podcasts and things like that. So, um, you know, I, I think generally people try and pick one technical and one non-technical, and uh, that seems to be a good rule. But uh, anyway, uh, we'll go ahead and jump into the picks and just share what it is and why. And uh, we'll start with Dave this time. Okay. Um Wow, uh, I, I missed last week. Has anybody uh, picked Exceptional Ruby by Avdi Grimm? Nope, go for it. Awesome, okay. So, uh, disclaimer, I am not just going to pick. I'm going to absolutely shill and plug. Um, Avdi sent me a free copy of this book. Um, I asked him if I could buy it because my karma needed uh, that, and he wouldn't let me buy it. He just sent me a free copy of the book. So, um, Exceptional Ruby, you are handling errors wrong in your code right now, and you're an idiot and Avdi Grimm can fix you. Um, <laughs> it's an entire book about exceptions, not just about like, well, you know, raise an exception, but I mean like what happens in Ruby when you call an exception? What happens uh, when, when an exception is triggered? What happens when you set one up? Um, what happens under the hood? And then he gets into like the trade-offs between like, you know, ways of handling, you know, exceptions that are not don't require raising an exception, like, you know, passing data back in the sideband, like passing back multiple return values or having output parameters or, and then that, and he gets into just crazy, crazy stuff. Um, and then he kind of gives you like the, the trade-offs between each of the different ways of doing it and how to pick. He tells you which exceptions you need to have in your app, uh, which ones you should have right from the get go and why, um, and when you should raise an exception and when you should just barf and throw an error. I, it's, it's just, the man just knows more about exceptions than anybody else here, and and his book is fifteen bucks. It's at exceptionalruby dot com. Cannot recommend it highly enough. I'm about halfway through it, and I absolutely, absolutely love it. Um, it is a great it, book. I I got to look through it a little, and just to add how important it is, it was you know developed and published outside of a big publisher, and then the Prags recently picked it up. So if that tells you how how cool it is, you know. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. Um, as for a non-technical... You don't have to if you don't want to. I don't to. have a good one. I don't have a good one. Yeah, not off the top of my head. I mean, I've got about, I've got about ten, uh, 10 books that I could recommend that all have to do with writing fiction. And uh, you know what? If you're into fiction writing... Uh, yeah, you know what? I'll, I'll, I'll plug one real easy. Um, How to Write Science Fiction and Fantasy by Orson Scott Card. Um, If you're into writing fiction, you you need to read this book because most writers will start one story um, and then they'll script their story by finishing a different story. They'll start an idea story and then finish a character story. And uh, Card actually lays out the rules. I've actually uh, pitched a talk proposal right now that I'm hoping to get accepted um, on how to write code this way. Um, to basically, if you start out with one type of API, you need to make sure you finish that exact same API so that your readers understand what you're doing. Oh, interesting. Yep. So All right. That's them's my picks. Great. Th- those are awesome. Uh, James, go ahead. Okay, so uh, my code and non-code picks the same this time because I'm a crazy guy. But um, <laughs> there's a contest coming up. Uh, it starts on June 16th, which is my birthday. Um, but it starts on June 16th, and it's called the International Conference for Functional Programming Contest. And every year there's this international conference for functional programming, like the name suggests, and uh, they get together and talk about functional languages. But one of the cool parts, in my opinion, is a few months before they hold the conference, usually like around the beginning of the fall, uh, around the beginning of the summer, they do a contest. And instead of you know closing their contest down and only allowing people to compete with functional languages, the way they prove their superiority, quote unquote, is they let anybody use anything they want to do the programming contest. So it's up to the functional guys to get in there and prove that their way is better, basically. Oh, that's which, cool. <laughs> which means it's up to us Rubyists to get in there and prove that it's not better. So we have a mission. We have to, we have to go do it. But seriously, if you enjoy programming contests, and you guys know I do from the Ruby quiz and such, but if you enjoy the, uh, those kind of things, this contest is 72 hours. Uh, it's definitely a, a great, very hard thing 
Uh, usually the problem is about 15 pages printed. Uh, so, you know, you, it, you take just a couple hours at the beginning of the contest to read the problem and try and figure out what you're doing. And uh, then you develop something working and, and refine it over time. And uh, I do terrible on these, by the way. I, uh, I usually come in uh, fairly low and, and I'm totally pleased with myself because just completing these problems is, is all the... Uh, uh, reward you you can need uh, and seeing your name up on the board. So uh, definitely, if you're into um, if you're into programming contests and you like a good challenge, get a bunch of your buddies together and uh, try this problem. Definitely don't try it alone. They're they're kind of scary, and you need some people to give you some ideas when you're fried because you'll definitely get fried. Um, but uh, Greg and I have done it together in the past multiple times, and. Um, and uh, it's a great time. You learn a lot. It's you know a big commitment, but uh, it's it's definitely worth it. So I recommend all Rubyists go try the International Conference for Functional Programming contest in cool. about a week, week and a half. So cool. two weeks from today. Sounds like fun. It is. That's exactly the kind of birthday present you like, James, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> My wife's like, you're going to do a programming contest on your birthday? It's like, yeah. It only comes once a year, so whenever mm -hmm. they put it, you know. Well, James was oh. up at like four in the morning to do the internet problem solving contest with me over Skype. So yeah. this is a pattern for him. Right. <laughs> Greg's, like, Greg's like, you want to wake up in the middle of the night and do a programming contest? Sure. Why not? I was going to say the, the phrasing on that sentence was a little bit wrong. I, I actually kind of can hear Dana actually saying, holy crap, you get to do a programming contest for your birthday? <laughs> yeah. Did they right. plan it? That's about right. Yeah, and for the rest of us, programming patterns are, are things that you get out of a book. Programming patterns for James is when he wakes up and what he gets to do for the day. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's hilarious. All right. We, we interrupted you, James. Anything else? Nope, that's it. That's my pick. Go do the contest. All right. Um, I have a couple of things that I have run across lately. Um, one of the first ones, I'm trying to find the book so I can give you the exact title here. Um I kind of started cleaning off my desk, and I can't find it. Oh, if only you had had a moment to prepare. Yeah, well, I, I, I actually, <laughs> I, I've been uh, replacing the power steering pump in my van, and uh, I kind of ran up here about a half hour before we were supposed to get started and, and was like, oh, guys, uh, hi. I've done that. So anyway, um, it Ooh. is the it is the um, Big Nerd Ranch Guide to, program, to iOS Programming. And... It's kind of a step-by-step -step, uh, tutorial in a book on how to build I iOS applications, and it has been really, really cool. It it, it kind of gives you what you need and uh, no more, and then you know the next the next stage is picking up the next steps, and it has been it's been really, really informative as far as learning how to program for iOS, and I highly recommend it. Um, it's by Aaron Hillegas, and I can't remember the other guy's name because I don't have it in front of me. But anyway, uh, super, super pick. And then the other pick that I, I want to let people know about um, is SlimTimer.com. And uh, I've been using SlimTimer for quite a while. And what I use it for is I use it for tracking my time when I'm working for clients uh, since I bill by the hour. So uh, they have a little, it's a handy little pop-up. And what, what you do is you, uh, you can actually move it up into your bookmark. So it's a bookmarklet. And then when you click on it, it opens up a, a slim timer with all of your tasks in it. And my task, I just list my clients. And then when you click on one of the clients, it starts the timer. If you click on them again, it stops the timer. If you click on another client, it stops the timer for the one and starts the timer for the other. And then at the end of the week, you can run a report and see how much time you spent for each task or each client. And, is that uh, a free service? It is free. Okay, that's cool. I, I currently use Harvest app and I absolutely love it, but it's not free. Yeah, Harvest is not free. Um, Harvest does some things that, that SlimTimer doesn't. I think you can do invoicing and stuff from Harvest. Yeah, you can. Um, but, you know, for me, it was just a really simple and easy way to keep track of my time. Yeah. And then I've been doing all my invoicing and stuff through QuickBooks Online. And, and that's kind of handy. I think it's a little overkill for what I'm doing with it, but it doesn't cost very much. So Yeah. Anyway, um, so those are my picks. And uh, we'll, we'll go ahead and let Greg uh, jump in and... Tell okay, just to make sure that I'm not repeating something that might have already been said, um, have you guys um, talked about Pry at all? 
Nope. Go nope. for it. Ooh. Okay. Pry is awesome. Um, it's it's an alternative for IRB. Um, I wouldn't necessarily call it that because um, I still use IRB for most of my just standard interactive stuff. But what it is is it's basically just a badass way to uh, do exploration and auditing and debugging and that sort of stuff in your code because it allows you to do things like drop the word pry in anywhere in your code base and then when you run the code it'll launch IRB like thing in directly at that place within the binding so that you can get access to all the local variables and all of that sort of stuff. How does that compare to uh, Ruby Debug, to just running the debugger? Um, it, does, it does a lot more than just that. I mean, that's uh -huh. one of the features that it has. Um, but it also does things like if you uh, run it and then you ask it to show uh, a method for an object, it'll pull the source and display the source for oh, you. Cool. Um, um, it'll pull the documentation and show you the documentation. Um, it... It basically, it actually, when it shows the source, it'll syntax highlight it on the terminal. Um, oh, that's nice. It does all sorts of wild stuff like that, and it's mm -hmm. it's really good. Like, I, I actually, I would say it's one of those tools that's really important for you to have in your tool belt. You won't use it every minute of every day, but, like, just today, as I'm starting to poke around in RubyGems, it's really useful to be mm -hmm. able to pull source on methods just by interacting with objects. Yeah. Um, now is, and, uh, is Pry available on SlimGems? <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah, I imagine so. So you know, you know, in a few weeks, that's not going to be a funny question. <laughs> yeah, you're right. It's not. You know, I. You know, it is funny. I was just thinking when you guys were talking. Um, uh, we need to do an episode on debugging at some point because uh, David Brady goes, "How is that different from Ruby debug?" And I'm like, "What puts?" <laughs> yeah. no, oh no! No, no so so to, to yeah, to, to we do need to do an episode on debugging because uh, Greg said that Pry will show you the source code. So will the debugger. And the question that I have about Pry is, if you go edit your source code in another window and then reload the source, the debugger gets out of sync. It goes, All right, with, this was on line seventeen when I started. I don't know where it is now. Does does Pry do that, or does Pry go? Oh, you moved. You know what? I actually don't know. Um, okay. It uses. Uh, it, I'm pretty sure that it uses Ruby 19 source location, um, and it, on Ruby 18, I think it backports that. Um, so if that works, then it should work. Uh, if it doesn't, then it won't. Um, Probably not. Yeah. It's neat because it's it's definitely more focused on the exploration aspect of things than just debugging. But like part of the debugging process is doing a little bit of that exploration. So I found it's been helpful. Um, yeah. I've used it in a few different ways. It's funny because the, the maintainer of this basically just came into the, the RMU IRC channel and just spammed me and told me to look at it, and then I actually <laughs> did. I, I, I don't know him, but uh, then I, I've been a major proponent, so I'm glad that he did that. Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, it's definitely worth checking out. Um, I... Like I said, it's not something that I use every single day, but when I use it, I'm glad it's there for sure. Yeah. Uh, the other thing that I wanted to say, and it's actually, I don't know that you can call it a pick because it's not a thing, but it's a, it's a soft skill. Um, and it's something that's always benefited me, but I've only really in the last few months or so, um, mainly through working uh, with Rubenica University, but also just the other stuff that I've been doing. I've really come to value the um, power of conversations with smart people. Um, and I'm talking both you know, through mailing lists and IRC and public settings and private conversations. I don't think that the progress that I've made in the course of a week on helping with this Ruby Gem situation would have been possible if I didn't go and talk to people one-on-one -on -one rather than just using broadcast mediums like Twitter and blogs and things like that. I've been using those. They're useful tools to get people who you might want to have a conversation with interested and also to sort of get your public information out there. But at the same time, like you can get a lot of progress on problems if you just talk to someone and find out what their, really, what their real problems are, what their real concerns are, that sort of thing. And I think that we, because we're so used to using broadcast mechanisms, that we, um, we underemphasize the value of actually talking person to person. Um, and it really, that's how RMU has become successful because that's how I've learned how to teach intermediate developers. Um, I would say a year ago, before I started doing the RMU stuff, I had a much worse understanding of the sort of problems that they go through. 
um, until I started just dealing with people every day, talking to them one on one. Um, so I think, I mean, that's sort of wishy washy, but at the same time, if you spend most of your time reading and searching and looking on blogs and broadcasting, spend a little bit of time just talking one on one with people and you'll find it'll really help you improve your craft. I, I can't agree strongly enough. I've, I've been doing a lot of remote pairing and just the, 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 the amount of problems you can solve by stopping typing and starting talking. I, I just can't agree. I just can't agree strongly enough. That's that's awesome. That's great. Are uh, we actually saying programmers need to develop their social skills? Where's my bag? I oh, shut up! <laughs> oh, shut up! <laughs> as much right. as James jokes about it, honestly, I mean, everybody knows that he mentored me for years, and it didn't really even sink in that like the reason why I learned so fast was just having someone available to talk through things because. You just get so much more directed help when there's a context around things. And most blog posts, unless they're extremely well written, tend to lack context in a big way. And just going on that information alone is just not good enough. Yeah. Uh, everybody get in here for a group hug. Oh. <laughs> All right. Um, I, I'm going to wrap this up. Uh, I think we just hit an hour, and uh, I really, really don't want to go over it. So there are two th two more things that I want to mention, and then and then we're going to be done. Uh, the first one is that next week, next Thursday, I'm actually going to be out of town, and I haven't found anyone else who can record the podcast. So I'll do it. Oh, you'll do it? Yeah. All right, cool. So uh, All right, we're in then. All right, so so next week uh, I won't be here, but I guess uh, they'll go on without me, and I'll I'll get with Dave and, and help him get stuff set up so he can post the episode and things. That'd be great. Be without our fearless leader, but we'll soldier on. Yes. <laughs> and uh, anyway, the other thing is is uh, um, the topic for next week we were going to talk about conferences and user user groups. And mm -hmm. uh, I think we're going to get into both organization and, of those and, uh, you know, just kind of how to, how to run them and how to make them happen. So uh, keep, keep an ear out next week. Um, and uh, I guess Dave and James will be running the show. So uh, Awesome. Yeah, that'll be horrible. Yeah. So anyway, um, finally, uh, go into iTunes, leave a review. Um, if you want to talk about this any further... Um, I think we're all willing to talk about it. You can contact any of us, or you can go to rubyrogues.com, look at the show notes, and uh, leave a comment. That would be uh, terrific. And awesome. uh, Anyway, I think that's it. We'll wrap it up because we're out of time, and we will catch you all next week. We'll see you later. See you next week. Bye.